in any case, I, uh, I do want to say good morning to uh, afternoon, evening to, to everybody uh, uh, joining. Um, uh, my name is Arjan Haan, I'm at IDRC. I'll be doing the facilitation. Um, I think you're all familiar with, with the uh, webinars. Uh, I hope this platform is clear. Uh, I just want to say that there's interpretation available into French and Spanish to access that. There's a, a little button at the top uh, which is called Kudo and under Kudo there's a drop down menu where you can find in those interpretations if you uh, need it, if you like to listen to it in Spanish or French. Uh, there's of course a chat fu function uh, and, and we very much encourage uh, there will be time for uh, Q&A open discussion uh, but I very much encourage everybody to put their questions comments to the speakers to uh, to to the panel uh, during the, during the presentations and we'll try to uh, collect those um, it's 802 uh, here uh, Julie uh, Julie can I can I turn over to you to start us off uh, welcome everybody Sure, Ariane, absolutely. So welcome everyone. It's great to see so many people online uh, today for this important discussion. I'm seeing more and more numbers add in into the, um, into the arrivals. My name is Julie Schuldice and I'm the Vice President for Strategy, Regions and Policy at Canada's International Development Research Centre. I'd like to start this morning by acknowledging that I'm joining you from IDRC's office in Ottawa, Canada, situated on the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. I'd also like to recognize that you are joining us today from many different places and invite you to think about the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. The topic of growing public debt and the need for debt relief is of the highest importance and of course at the forefront of this forum on financing for development. When the pandemic hit, low income countries had limited fiscal space to address its impacts. Levels of public debt have since continued to rise and the risk ratings of many economies have been downgraded. As global interest rates are rising, accessing capital will be even more difficult, and the recent and ongoing war in Ukraine, devastating for its population, is also further aggravating the economic uncertainties and hardship in many countries around the world. IDRC, as part of Canada's foreign affairs and development efforts, champions and funds research and innovation within and alongside developing regions to drive global change. The combined impact of the COVID pandemic and public debt coupled with impacts on poverty, particularly for women, has been an important focus of our work over the past two years. The economic challenges we're seeing are of critical importance for the possibility of achieving the sustainable development goals. Countries need to be able to invest in already underfunded health systems, in education, and increasingly to address the impacts of climate change. New funding will be needed, and this UN Forum has made enormous contributions to promoting that case, which is why we feel it is important to engage through our discussion today. The theme for our discussion that we'll focus on is sustainable and inclusive debt relief. Over the coming years, debt relief will be essential, and this will involve new actions by all creditors. At the same time, countries will need innovative policies to manage that debt relief and simultaneously invest in the future, to restore economic growth with the goal of advancing towards the SDGs while addressing the growing, the growing climate crisis. So with that in mind, it's my great pleasure to welcome our panelists who will be introduced shortly and our partner organizations, Red Sur, the Economic Research Forum and the Finance for Development Lab. These organizations are developing new research on the policies in low income countries, those most affected by debt challenges and on the important new initiatives to do so. I'm very much looking forward to hearing your perspectives today. I would also like to thank our colleagues at the Canadian Permanent Mission to the UN for their support to this event. So without further ado, it's my great honour to now introduce you to Canada's Ambassador to the UN, the Honourable Bob Ray, for his opening remarks. Ambassador Ray has been an advocate for social justice in Canadian and international politics, and in addition to many other distinguished roles, has been Canada's special envoy for Myanmar and on humanitarian and refugee issues. Since 2020, he's been Canada's permanent representative to the UN, where he champions the cause of the Sustainable Development Goals. Ambassador Ray holds a leadership role in the preparatory process of the fifth UN Conference on Least Developed Countries, 
co-chairing the preparatory committee and the negotiation of the outcome document for the conference alongside Ambassador Rabab Fatima of Bangladesh. Ambassador Ray, thank you so much for your continued support to this work, and we very much look forward to hear your perspective from the UN headquarters on the question of financing for development and what needs to be done to address continued uncertainties. Ambassador Ray, I pass the floor to you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Judy. It's great to be with everyone. I really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to speak with you this, this morning. Um, it's a very timely topic, um, and I, I also want to say to uh, everyone who's listening that uh, we in Canada are very proud of IDRC. It's a it's a critical initiative that we took many many years ago to work with uh, research institutes around the world and to encourage uh, evidence based policies uh, it, uh, at at every corner. Um, and uh, I'm delighted that uh, IDRC is uh, is sponsoring this uh, this session uh, today. Um, it's when I say it's timely. Uh, two nights ago, I was at a very lively discussion with the Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed and uh, Achim Steiner and a number of other uh, permanent representatives. And this was exactly the topic that we were discussing, uh, that the situation, as I'll come to talk about it, is, is, uh, is unfortunately not getting better and the need for stronger collective action is, um, is, uh, is, is growing. And I can assure you that this issue is, uh, is front and center uh, in in our work at the UN, in Canada's work at the UN, uh, but also within the UN organization um, itself. As uh, Judy's mentioned, I've had the opportunity to work on a number of initiatives for the least developed countries. Uh, when I first came to New York two years ago, I joined uh, with Jamaica and the Secretariat uh, to lead a discussion on financing for development, which uh, led to I think some very important recommendations uh, that we had a remarkable process of engaging with civil society in a number of member states, a number of well-known experts around the world, and uh, really began a process of developing a, a range of policy options, policy approaches that would be necessary to, to take us through the, uh, the COVID crisis and beyond. Um, and that, that, process I think has proven to be very fruitful but the point is you, you 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 do those things and then some of your recommendations are taken up not all of them are taken up and you then have to keep pushing to to see how we can uh, make even more progress in the um, in the in the in the time in the time ahead and over the last year as again Judy mentioned I've been involved with the Doha uh, program of action which uh, will be has been delayed because of COVID uh, in terms of the actual discussion but it's been adopted by the General Assembly as the basis for a new approach that uh, we hope will be uh, strengthened uh, in the conference that will take place a, a, a little less than a year from now in Doha. But we we wanted the General Assembly to embrace the approach that we were taking and to, and to push it forward because we felt very much that we needed, couldn't wait until March to uh, to begin the discussion of what steps are going to be are going to be required. Now this is not a legally binding document. It, it's a roadmap for sustainable development that has had a, a lot of input from least developed countries. And um, we're hoping that we can, some of the things that I'm going to say today will actually take, uh, take, uh, take place and will have, begin to happen more quickly. Uh, this is one general observation I would make is that um, long ago in politics, when I was in Canadian politics, I learned that there's a difference between market time, real time, and government time. Uh, and if that's true for domestic governments, it's even more true for international organizations. Uh, we are constantly having to recognize that the time frame in which decisions are made is frequently much slower than the realities of the situations that are confronting us. Um, and this is really, really true uh, today. Um, if we were having this conversation six months ago, uh, we would have had an eye on what's happening in what was happening in uh, in eastern Ukraine, and we would have been observing some disturbing trends. Uh, but nobody would have predicted that the the pace of uh, the war would would take the course that it has, uh, and that it would have the impact that it's had 
um, and the, the whatever early warning systems we have in place in the UN um, are, are frequently not strong enough in order to allow us to make actually make decisions in real time to meet the seriousness of the situation that we're facing. So we are, if you like, uh, broadly speaking, facing what I would call four real shocks. Um, the underlying shock to the system uh, has been the, the growing inequality that we see uh, around the world. And while the pace of change uh, and technological change is, is one that some countries have been able to take advantage of, many other countries have been left further behind. So we had this phenomenon, which we describe in the, in the Doha program of action, which is that the poorest countries are being left further behind. Um, and the debt situation is, is, a, is a real example of that. And I'll, I'll come to it. Um, overall. The second shock is the shock of climate change, which is huge uh, and which is continuing. It's relentless. It's never stopping. As we speak today uh, in India, Pakistan, and in that part of South Asia, temperatures are up over 40 degrees uh, Celsius and heading, to, heading in some circumstances to 50. And we're going to see an incredible um, reaction in terms of health and ability of economies to function in that kind of circumstance. We don't know what the storms will be this uh, this coming summer. Uh, we know the monsoon season and the hurricane season are going to bring very quick disaster. And countries can go from middle income or even high income to no income in the space of a few minutes. <laughs> and I think it's because we talk about climate change and we talk about targets in 2050, we often think it's a slow process, but we need to understand that it's it's not a slow process. We are in the middle of climate change now. It is having a devastating impact on economies in real time. It's creating drought. Uh, it's creating um, uncertain uh, weather and planting seasons. It's devastating agriculture in many, many countries. And this means it's having a very serious impact on the, the financial situation and ultimately the liquidity situation. The third shock, of course, is the, is the shock of the pandemic, uh, which again has been dramatically unequal uh, in its impact because our response has been so unequal. Uh, I think when uh, future historians come to look at this period, they will really remark on how uh, uneven and unequal the response to COVID has been and how, uh, frankly, ineffective we have been in, in, in getting at it in real time. We are getting at it in the sense that more uh, vaccines are being made available to more people around the world. But what we're learning about the virus, of course, is that it mutates and changes. Uh, and as it mutates and changes, it has new impacts that uh, are surprising. I don't think anybody would have believed, again, three years ago that now Shanghai, the financial capital of China, which is uh, the rapidly growing economy whose, uh, whose presence is, is transforming uh, the global economy, uh, would be in a state of continued lockdown and health crisis because of the, uh, of the impact of the, pan of the virus and also because of the nature of the response of the Chinese government to it. So we need to keep an eye and understand that we're not out of COVID yet. Uh, with great respect to Dr. Fauci, who all of us, I think, recognize as a wonderful public servant. I'm not sure we can talk globally. I, I know we can't talk globally about being in a post-pandemic uh, time, which is what he was saying yesterday about the United States. I'm not even sure it's true of the United States, but I certainly don't think it's true globally. And we have to think more globally when we think about the, the pandemic. It's something that forces us to look at this thing in a, in a broader way. And finally, we have the impact of Ukraine. Um, which, uh, in addition to being a, uh, a devastating war, as has been said, it's had a dramatic impact of, uh, economically on the global economy. And we're seeing, again, the interconnectedness of things. We're seeing how supply chains are disrupted. And when those things are disrupted, it has a dramatic effect on supply, obviously, and then on price. Uh, and, and that is something which we all need to be aware of. And we also need to be aware of what the political knock-on effects of this are going to be uh, in terms of looking at the number of countries that are um, very ser seriously impacted. 
the impact is 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 right now devastating and it's going to be more devastating and i think we have to sound the alarm uh much more loudly about what is happening and the need for a much stronger collective um response um and we are going to see a liquidity crisis in a number of countries we are going to see defaults we are going to see a serious impact on on debt and we're then going to understand the 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 the, the ongoing issues of conflict and uh and and tensions that already exist in light of the underlying uh disruptive forces which i've which i've been describing and i think it's really important to to appreciate that the reason that the un is so heavily involved now is because it isn't we can't simply leave somebody once said you can't leave the war to the generals and and you can't you can't lead all these debt issues to uh, to the banks whether they're public banks international banks <laughs> to the global financial system on its own there has to be political direction and it has to involve directly the the united nations and that i think is something that i feel i feel very strongly and i i, I think there's a number of, of people here at the un who feel that uh, as as well we need to bring in all sovereign creditors into the process we need increased transparency about who owes what to who uh, and how we are going to deal with that and we also need to bring private creditors into the discussion because one of the things that's happened over the years is that uh, public public traditional uh, public creditors if you like the paris group uh, have simply not kept kept up with the level of demand for credit and so uh, borrowers have gone to a number of other places they've gone obviously to countries like china and some others but china most notably and they've also gone to private creditors and the the transparency of those transactions is not at a standard which i think most of us would feel important and that's what's led to the development of what we call the common framework which requires transparency from both creditors and, and and debtors and it also requires increased uh, good governance and strong regulatory frameworks sometimes people feel that these ideas th the focus on corruption the focus on transparency is is these concepts are being weaponized by the developed countries uh, by the advanced economies and i i i i think we have to avoid doing that but I also think we have to recognize that these things are actually global goods. Um, corruption is a bad thing. Uh, <laughs> I think we have to, we need to have the courage to recognize that it's a bad thing. It, it's not only the people who are receiving the money, if you like, who are causing the problem, it's the people who are giving the money who are causing the problem as well. And breaking the cycle of corruption is extremely difficult, but it's important. It's important to do. This new global architecture that we think is important is means focusing on debt sustainability addressing the cost of financing and liquidity challenges boosting investments in the real economy tackling illicit financial flows which go both ways to the develop, developing countries and from the developing countries and advancing a fair and effective international tax system and going beyond gdp uh, i do i'm a strong supporter of the multidimensional vulnerability index we call it mvi i think it's very important i think we've seen in real time how that is going to be necessary particularly when we look at small island developing states we look at a number of other situations we need to understand <coughs> that we need an index that takes us beyond where we have been and it's extremely it's all it's easy to say but it's hard to do uh, and and i think there's a lot of resistance to to doing it because people say it's it's uh, it may be too difficult but I think we have to understand that it, without it, we're not going to be able to meet the challenges that many countries are facing and that makes them vulnerable and that puts them in a very, very difficult situation. The, we, 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 are, we are seeing it happen. It's, it's in a slow development. Number of, we, we called for the MVI in, in, uh, in, in our FFD process um, uh, in, in New York. Um, it's been discussed with the World Bank. It's being discussed by the IMF. Uh, the UN is once again involved uh, in in developing the idea, and I think it's something that uh, that needs to needs to needs to proceed. Um, in terms of research, or in terms of the work of uh, of research institutes, uh, I just want to stress how important it is for this work to continue to inform uh, the development of good public policy. Um, th there will have to be a major decision made in the near future on. Uh, what kind of debt relief can be provided? We're going beyond, I think, 
simple uh, debt holidays or interest rate holidays or things of that kind. There's going to have to be a fundamental restructuring of debt, and there's every restructuring of debt that's taken place over the last uh, 50 years always involves uh, write-offs, and it involves reduction in actual debt levels. And we shouldn't beat around the bush about that. That is going to be necessary, and anybody who thinks it isn't going to be necessary isn't looking at the real situation. In our conversation last night, uh, two nights ago, um, the UN is setting up a, has set up an emergency uh, response team that is trying to understand the interconnectedness of the situation in Ukraine, in the impact on uh, on food and the impact on on debt and liquidity. And there are now about seventy countries that have been described as being in 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 actual trouble uh, and serious crisis. And there probably are as many as a hundred who, if things get worse rather than better, uh, will will join that group. And we need to understand what the impact of that uh, potentially is and how, in my experience, based on what I've seen both domestically in Canada and, and around the world, you can go from hero to zero really quickly. Uh, and uh, a lot of predictions about what will happen um, are uh, underestimate the seriousness of the problem and the speed with which things can, can go wrong. And also the relative weakness of the governance structures globally to deal with the crisis. Uh, we have not yet created uh, strong permanent structures that will allow for um, a, a measured, serious, but deep response to the nature of the crisis. Uh, and looking at uh, various statements that governments are making, including some key governments, uh, you can see that uh, there's still a, still a resistance to some basic things um, happening. And that, I think, is something we need to work on. So I'll stop there, and I uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak. I may have spoken a little longer than you thought, but I have to say I've <laughs> I have a lot to say about this subject. It's a critical issue for us, uh, and we really are going to need all of your help. And I look at the, all the people who are on the panel and others who are contributing say that we very, very much need your participation in finding an effective global response to what is a serious global issue. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Ambassador Ray. I, I really appreciate that and, and whatever time you can give us is, is fantastic. It's great. You know, I think as it's always energizing to hear about the work that you're doing um, at the UN and, you know, on behalf of Canada, but also the leadership that you are bringing to these conversations. Um, I really appreciate the four shocks that you talked about because I think they align with many of the things that we at IDRC have been seeing as well, particularly around climate change and inequalities, but also overlaying COVID and now the interconnectedness connectedness that we're learning about and really having to face with what's happening in Ukraine. Um, I think you've set us up really well in talking about what's really at stake in terms of the challenges that we're encountering and what that's going to mean in terms of, of broadly financing for development, but also managing debt. So thank you for setting us off on this conversation today. And I'll pass back to Ariane to bring us into the next stage of the conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Judy. Good to talk with you. I'll, I'll put myself on mute. Thanks so much, uh, Julie. Yeah, can you hear me okay, Julie? Th and thanks very much, Ambassador. This this was this was a wonderful introduction, and I think what uh, what we will hear is is exactly the kind of research to inform that policy that that you're referring to. Uh, the, the the group of uh, researchers on this uh, on this this panel uh, represent research institutions in the global south that are currently working on uh, what those uh, national policy actions should look like in the context of that debt relief in 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 twelve low income. Income, uh, income countries that is that is managed by uh, by by two uh, network uh, research organizations. Uh, one is uh, Red Sur, based in in Latin America. The other one is the Economic Research Forum. And, and in each of those consortiums, there are some uh, some six uh, country studies. That research, I want to emphasize to uh, to everybody, that research uh, is very new. Uh, it, it is very hard research, I think, because of this constantly changing uh, constantly changing situation, makes it more important. And and that's why I think this is such a 
wonderful opportunity to bring a number of the the, the researchers from that consortium to this uh, to this roundtable to inform their work and and to make those connections ambassador. Uh, we'll start off with uh, uh, with Ramiro uh, Ramiro Abreu uh, who represents uh, Red Sur. He, he is at CPEC in in Argentina and he will start us off with uh, uh, with describing the context of that in in Latin America. Uh, we'll then we'll then move to a similar scene setting in 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 Africa uh, and and the Middle East. Um, we will do this in two rounds. Uh, each presenter will first describe the context, regional, and then in in a number of countries, as we will see. And then in the second round, and I know it's a very very tight program, so I encourage everybody to be very brief in that description because the second round is is really a presentation of the kind of solutions that uh, that each of the researchers are uh, are working on. Ramiro, over to you. And 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 as I said, I, I uh, you know our, our schedule is very tight, uh, yeah. so please do the first round in particular as brief as you can. Thank you so much, Ramiro. Okay, thanks, Arshan, and thanks IDRC for the support of trying to understand better our debt problems. And I really yeah. like Ambassador Rice Rice comments on because I was going to say that we need two to tango. You know, creditors and debtors, but we need three to tango because you, we need the UN, we need someone trying to set the rules of the discussion. So I will go to very quick to Latin American debt outlook and prospects. <clears throat> First, let me start with the history of public debt in Latin America over the 21st century. We, it is kind of a U shape curve, you know. We started with all these crises at the turn of the century. Argentina, Brazil, Ecuador, Venezuela, and then Ecuador, uh, Ecuador, I just mentioned. And other than from 2003 to maybe 2010, we had a very special period of debt reduction and also of new debt management strategies, you know, trying to move away from hard currency debt, trying to deepen uh, domestic bond markets and so on. So, so we have less public debt and less uh, risky public debt during this period. But then we enter a new global period of easy money, you know, uh, and set for yield in, in financial creditors. And so our region, Latin America, entered into a new process of, of uh, rapid uh, in indebtment, uh, particularly in the bond market. <clears throat> that, that, that was a second decade. <clears throat> Sorry, we can say of the of this century, and then we we it came the pandemics, and, and it was a, like I, I'm, I, uh, if you look at the public debt data, you see that this the the, the the year when where, where we took the the biggest accumulation of fiscal risks in one year. You know, I mean public debt rose from 60 percent to 70 percent in just one year. So that, that was for for us in Latin America. That's huge, huge. Uh, and then we have the war in Ukraine <clears throat> and all the impacts about that. I think that in that case, of course, we have an impact on commodity prices and, and global growth. But I think that the main connection is indirect. It has to do with the, 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 the acceleration in the normalization of U.S. monetary policy. You know, for us in Latin America, worst news is the U.S. rising interest rates. That, that's, that's early 80s late 90s so i imagine that that was our debt crisis so in a way i believe that we are entering into this kind of uh, dynamics i'm not saying that we are going to repeat history because history doesn't repeat itself but it rhymes you know so i think that we are entering to this kind of situations now if you look at if you look at Ramiro, specifically can I, to, Ramiro, yeah can i just stop you for a second i think somebody has shared their screen uh, uh, uh so here i see can you stop sharing the screens and keep uh, mics muted please yeah continue ramiro it doesn't interrupt yeah. your uh, presentation okay so 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 now we are uh, if we go to lower middle income countries such as bolivia el salvador honduras nicaragua for example in our region we can see the same u-shaped curve for public debt uh, but we also can see a higher dependency on external debt, you know, uh, in a way uh, as a failure to de-dollarize their economies over the last decades. 
Uh, of course, a lot of this debt is medium to, to long term debt. That's good news. But anyway, there's a high dependency. If you took, for example, El Salvador or, or, or Nicaragua, you will see that almost 100% of public debt is foreign currency debt. So, so it's, it's not the same in Bolivia, where it's 35%, for example. So what I'm saying is that there you can see a lot of new, uh, a particular risk in lower middle income countries in Latin America regarding the connections to global markets, particularly bond markets. And, and also some bilateral markets, uh, creditors such as China. So the outlook is really complex in these countries because we will have low growth. It means low revenue growth for the government. We will have a lot of pressures on exchange rates. We will have a lot of, uh, I mean, a big uh, uh, primary deficits, particularly, for example, in Honduras because of the, the hurricanes and, and so on. So we will start to discuss the fiscal consolidation and debt relief very, very soon. Um, in Argentina, we are already, <laughs> as you know, discussing that for years now. But what I'm saying is in lower and middle income countries, I think that we will see this period of frictions, discussion between creditors and debitors and so on. And I believe, and let me just finish with that, uh, we will see these trade-offs between financing development and, and, and searching financial sustainability of public accounts. We will see these tensions because, again, in our history, when we need to consolidate fiscal accounts, we drop a, a, a capital expenditures, education expenditures, long-term expenditures as, 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 as a general item. So I think that we are entering to, enter to this uh, the kind of windows, you know, of a lot of distress, a lot of problems, and a lot of help. We, we, need a, we, we will need a lot of help from the international community. Thank you so much, Ramiro. And 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 we'll need that the national based, local based research to 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 understand those dynamics. And I said it, it takes what is it? It takes three to tango. I, it's a new variant of a Argentinian tango, I suppose. But absolutely, it needs it needs all those parties together, and that's the work that uh, that you're leading in that case will will, will be so important. Uh, turning to um, uh, Isaac Divan then uh, to to give us a similar overview of situation in Africa and uh, MENA and then Professor Diwan, he he represents the economic research forum. He's one of the co-founders of the finance for uh, for development lab and and uh, it, it is uh, it's a great honor that you're leading this work and uh, we're looking forward to uh, to your overview as well. Thank you Ariane and greetings uh, from Beirut, Lebanon. I, I hope electricity or the line doesn't drop because of our financial crisis here. Um, I want to pick up really where the ambassador and then Ramiro took us and, and ask in the case of Africa and the Middle East, to what extent in the current debt crisis that's shaping up, to what extent is it possible to deal with this tension of financial development uh, versus the fiscal account? To, to what extent can we finance development versus the fiscal account, really, and the Argentinian problem? Uh, and, and this is, uh, I, I want to thank IDRC for funding all of these groups to think about exactly that question. In the current debt crisis, what should be the adjustment and reform programs that will come together with the debt workouts that fit the 2020s, uh, the circumstances of, of today, which are very different from the circumstances of the previous period where, where we had debt reduction. Uh, in the 90s or in the 2000s with, with, with HIPEX uh, and, and uh, with that reduction in the Middle East as well. I want to share my screen. I put together a PowerPoint if I can manage to. Um, see, is it on? Can you see it? No. No. Well. Uh, okay. Well, um, it's gonna, coming. No. Is it coming? No. 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 
Okay, well, let me not share my screen and then just speak. So the big question, I mean, the main question I'm going to ask here uh, is how do we think about the, the adjustment and reform programs in Africa and in the Middle East for, for the coming period? Uh, what are the key differences uh, with, with, with the past? Uh, now, there are differences in terms of external finance and there are differences in terms of the the uh, the 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 structure the structural constraints for development uh, in terms of the external finance the ambassador did a very good job describing the new common framework that was put together by the G20 to try to deal with the heterogeneities of uh, the, the 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 large heterogeneity of creditors you know in particular the fact that besides the Paris club there is China also and this coordination issue is still in its infancy uh, there, there are weak sticks and, and carrots for the private lenders, and many countries have uh, approached uh, the private markets, the bondholders in Africa, as well as in the Middle East. And uh, importantly, and Ramiro talked about that, there is increasing domestic debt as well uh, in foreign or in domestic currency. So, so there are many new elements uh, for that coordination. And even more than in the 80s and in the 90s, there is a risk of a slow resolution of, of, of the debt overhang. Uh, and so there is a big question here, which I'm not going to focus on, uh, whether question, whether these problems would be solved slowly as they emerge, as we're doing, or whether it's possible to, 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 to have a coming together and, and solve them in, in, in a big scoop. Already we're seeing, for example, in Chad, uh, that uh, the, the, the creditor committee is not functioning very well because uh the, there is collateralized debt and and the imf cannot lend into arrears in such a situation so that's a big issue to resolve in ethiopia in zambia countries in in arrears that have entered the common framework the the issue of coordination with china is an issue that has not been resolved and, and there are many questions there about whether china would play the paris club game or would want to define its own principles, some kind of Shanghai principles, Shanghai club to resolve the debt problems uh, in, in a club way for countries where it is very exposed. Uh, in the case of Ghana, which is not yet in arrear, but in difficulties, it is not a country that's not coming to, uh, to the fore, to the common framework, because it fears losing market access, which it has cultivated uh, over time. It fears the IMF conditionality. And in, in Lebanon, where I sit, it's a totally different problem. Most of the debt is internal, and it turns out that sharing the losses internally is extremely difficult politically. So this is now blocking all, all the reforms. So, you know, these issues complicate the resolutions on uh, among the creditors and, and, and would take some time. Uh, but let's focus now on the internal uh, question. What should the debtors demand in these deals? The, the the issue of uh, fiscal account and, and austerity is uh, is is known, so there is no reason I think to to spend too much time on it. Uh, perhaps a few words on the origin of the overhang, and then I would uh, I would go to four key structural uh, dimensions that are very different from the 80s and the 90s that need to be taken into consideration in putting these programs together. Um, you know, like like in the 90s, the debt overhang comes after a long period of, of fiscal expansions. Uh, in, in the sub-Saharan Africa uh, countries, the period 2000 to 2015 is, is an extraordinary period of growth and, and, and convergence. Uh, it comes after the HIPIC debt reduction, so there is space to expand on debt. There is a commodity boom uh, with more export and more more revenues, and there is generous access to capital markets. So there's uh, very low interest rate and liquidity globally, and so there is uh, uh, access there. And finally, China starts spending massively in Africa, uh, up to $20 billion a year in some years. And so there's a lot of inflows and, and lots of growth. And indeed, many low income countries become lower middle income countries and, and start transitioning out of 
ODA. As the ambassador said, there's less Paris Club bilateral money coming in and more access to more expensive debt from the market and, and, and from China. So even though growth uh, is, is pretty high at three, four, five percent, depending on the countries, uh, the, the, the interest rates are high and debt is, is also growing uh, pretty fast. And then comes a gross slowdown even before the, 19, the, the 2019 shock around 2015. Uh, so this is the story in Africa. And then there is, of course, the shocks of, uh, of COVID and, and, and Ukraine that exacerbate uh, the, the debt. And, and this is where we get to a situation where possibly two thirds of the continent is facing debt difficulties and several countries, uh, including Ethiopia, Zambia and Chad in particular, uh, start running arrears. The story uh, of coming into that difficult situation is different in uh, in the Middle East and North Af uh, Africa. It, it benefits from the same easy access to the market, but it's really after 2011, uh, the, the Arab Spring, that uh, there is a need for, for more spending, more public spending that, that lead to, to high level of uh, borrowing and, and in indebtedness. So it's a period of slow growth and fast rising debt that leads to this debt crisis uh, in Lebanon, uh, in Tunisia now, and tight situations, I would say, in, in Egypt, in Jordan, and uh, uh, in Morocco, potentially. Um, now, there are exacerbating political factors, I would say more than in the, in the 80s and 90s, both in Africa and in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, in that civil society uh, is more vocal. And, and could react more violently to, to austerity, especially in situations where trust in government is, is low. Uh, and so uh, the fiscal uh, problem, the traditional fiscal problem of trying to reduce the problem through austerity is, is, uh, could be extremely costly politically. We're already seeing army takeovers in, in both regions. Uh, and and so uh, I think from a stability perspective, being able uh, to to make deals where uh, there is more effort to grow out of the problem and and to uh, uh, to maintain some growth is is going to be really important globally, uh, especially uh, uh, just also to say that on the political front, uh, let's also keep in mind that many of the LICs, the low income countries, are close to or in the failed state challenge. So in, in their case, uh, the political involvement in rebuilding political settlement, providing incentives for state to, to stay in, uh, not to become pariah state is, is going to be very important. But let me come to my main point uh, and, and, and finish quickly here on the key differences uh, in economic structure that we have to keep in mind. This, this, this has parallels with what we heard from the ambassador. Uh, I think there are really four issues that need to be taken very seriously when these programs are put together. Uh, one has to do with the fact that internal debt is very large. Uh, second has to do with the fact that a lot of investment, public investment and private investment have taken place in the past 30 years, and those needs to be maintained and not uh, uh, be allowed to deteriorate. Uh, a third is the climate challenge, and, and the last one is what I would call the globalization backlash. Uh, so just a few words on each uh, before I conclude. I'm sorry I'm not able to show you. I have beautiful graphs on, on each. On, on the public debt being largely internal, there uh, many countries, especially as they move from LIC to uh, middle, lower middle income countries, were pushed uh, to, to borrow domestically more, to develop their domestic markets. And that's good, of course. Uh, only we are now in a situation where uh, there is high debt, but also a very large share of this debt in some countries is domestic and a large share of this domestic debt is held by banks. So when there is a, a crisis of public debt, you also get a crisis of domestic banks. And that's what we call the second generation crisis. And they are different from first generation public sector crisis only in that you can suddenly have uh, 
stop, a uh, sudden stop of capital. They are like a bank run. These crises uh, depend on uh, the, the, the credibility of, of, of policy and can suddenly arise and, and they could uh, uh, come together in, in many countries. You can have contagion. Uh, they depend on, uh, they, they, they rely a lot on, on expectations. Uh, that is ex ante and exposed they are very difficult to resolve because exactly like in the case of lebanon it involves burden sharing between internal and external creditors but also among domestic creditors uh, taxing the rich in the case of lebanon it's the elites that refuse to 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 reform and to clean up the banking system uh, and uh, th th there are many countries in the middle east uh, and in Africa as well, you know, Ghana, Sierra Leone, uh, Burundi, Gambia, Zambia, Angola, uh, that are in the situation of of, uh, of a second generation crisis. And so, so that's that's very different, and that will have to color uh, very much the way in which uh, these programs are, are are put together. The the second issue has to do with uh, the protection of of public assets during the first debt crisis. Uh, you know, the previous boom period was one of import substitution. So a lot of the industries with, that were built were simply not competitive and, and, and not many were, were protected and survived the adjustment programs. But at this particular juncture, uh, the, the, there are uh, lots of public assets, especially infrastructure that were financed by debt in the previous three decades and not maintaining them. Uh, would be absolutely disastrous for future growth, but maintaining them requires liquidity. And so, you know, debt deals have to think a lot about new money and how to preserve space to uh, to, to to manage. Uh, uh, there are questions of reforms also, you know, how you manage better public infrastructure that should importantly figure in these programs. Uh, the third one is is uh, is the climate and and how to finance uh climate action you know mitigation and adaptation now what's interesting uh, there are several points here from a finance perspective that we have to integrate into these programs first uh, we're not talking billions we're talking trillions when it comes to uh, to green finance uh, these programs cost a whole lot the second important point though is that the these are investments that have very high rate of return uh, in the case of, of mitigation, for example, you're replacing uh, gas with, with solar. Uh, actually, the NPV of producing solar these days is cheaper than producing gas. So it's a good investment. But from a liquidity perspective, it's very different. When you invest in solar, it's all upfront. When you go through in, in, in gas, gas or coal, uh, you're paying for the coal or the gas every year. So, so it's over time. So the interest rates at which you borrow, the availability of credit is crucial to make mitigation uh, interesting. If a country cannot borrow externally, it would not be allowed to invest massively in solar. Uh, and so credit worthiness, access to credit is crucial for mitigation. And the same for adaptation. The return to adaptation progr programs, projects could be sometimes in the 100% return. It's huge. But again, uh, you cannot tax the future to finance the present investments if you cannot borrow. Uh, and so the, the credit worthiness challenge becomes very important. And in terms of the programs, it puts a lot of weight on debt reduction. You know, the more re debt you can reduce, the more space you have for the future. It has implication for, we'll hear later about that for nature swaps. It's exactly that idea. Uh, the final point I'll put very quickly on the table is this uh, the high tech, the deglobalization, the robotization of the world. The, in the 80s and the 90s, we were thinking about the export led growth, you know, to grow your export. This is not going to be as possible in the future. Technology is useful to, to increase uh, productivity domestically, but not so much to export anymore. So, access to foreign exchange is going to be very tight. And that, again, uh, I think warned us when we do the essays, the sustainability analysis, let's not be too optimistic about future growth of foreign exchange. And that, again, militates for deeper debt reduction. 
uh, I, I want to stop there and, and, and hear from different countries, you know, how they see uh, elements of that sort in, integrated into their programs. Thank you. Back to you, Ariane. Thank, thank, thank you so much, Isaac. The Such an important emphasis on the differences, the commonalities, but the differences across countries and the complexities uh, within those countries. And and, and indeed, we, we uh, the next three uh, short interventions uh, will be of, of three country cases, three of the researchers working in those low income contexts. And um, first of all, Isa, I, I, we didn't see your slides, but you are still on the system sharing your screen. If you can try to stop sharing that, um, the next presenter uh, will be uh, will be Ma Ma Ekruchu is at CSEA uh, uh, in in Nigeria, and and she will give us an overview of uh, what that that situation looks like in in Nigeria. Hi everyone. Good, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. Um, I will share my screen shortly. Please let me know when you can see the slides. I believe it's, yes, we're coming on now. I can see your slide, yeah. Okay, all well, right. You're great. much more skillful than I am, uh, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it was the system. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Ma. Yes. So today uh, we'll be going through uh, debt for climate and development swaps the, using Nigeria as a case study. Um, first off, I will focus on the background for this uh, first round of intervention. So basically, what is the debt landscape in Nigeria? Um, so. The graph to my right, the, 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 the top right, uh, it shows that Nigeria's debt trajectory since 2000 has been U-shaped. Uh, debt declined significantly after we benefited from the 2005 debt relief program, where official creditors you know, provided us with, with debt relief. And, but it's increased very quickly, particularly from 2015 when uh, we had to borrow a lot uh, due to chronic fiscal and current account deficits, as well as weak commodity prices. So just to put some figures to the shape uh, or, or to the graph, uh, debt to GDP declined from 59% in 2004 to 17% by 2008, but it's increased to 29% by 2019. Now, a very important dimension of our debt situation is how much we are, how much revenue we are, we are locating for debt service purposes. So, at the peak of the pandemic, we allocated the, the federal government spent about eighty nine percent of its revenue, eighty nine percent, on interest payments for federal government loans. You know, which leaves really little for. Uh, combating the, the, the pandemic, whether it's, uh, whether it's financing the health sector or social protection sectors, right? So we're in a dire situation at the peak of the pandemic. And, you know, the, the pandemic, it's important to note that the pandemic worsened the already bad debt situation in Nigeria. So we had high fiscal deficits, fair revenue shortages uh, because of the economic lockdowns and also because of the collapse in, in, in oil price. But at the same time, we had to increase, increase expenditure uh, for sectors that would pull us out of the recession that we found ourselves. And so we had to borrow on all the more at the peak of the pandemic. Um, uh, the second dimension of our debt situation is how the creditor landscape has changed significantly. So whereas in, and you know, this has been alluded to, or this has been talked about by Honorable Ray, where, you know, Paris club creditors are unable to keep up with the demands that uh, developing countries have when it comes to uh, loans, right? Um, so whereas at the peak of the, whereas in 2000, uh, bilateral creditors, we owed a lot of our debt to bilateral creditors. Um, the graph, sorry about that. The graph at the bottom left shows Nigeria's debt disaggregated by creditors. And we see how bilateral creditors, which is the blue block, 
you know, amounted to a large share of our debts in the, in the early 2000s. But coming down to 2017, 2007, 2008, we see how that dropped significantly just after the, the debt relief initiative. And then we see multilateral creditors and private creditors. Multilateral creditors is the red block. We see how multilateral creditors and the private creditors, the yellow block, how they now emerge as dominant creditors in the country. And this trend can also be seen across other low and middle income countries in the continent. So the graph at the bottom right shows sub-Saharan Africa's debt disaggregated by creditors. And we see how the blue block, which is bilateral debt, has accounted for a lower share, about half actually, accounts for only, it, it has declined by half uh, uh, of, of total debts, whereas multilateral debts and private debts has increased significant, significantly. Um, so I'll hand over to the next presenter. Um, at the second round of interventions, we'll discuss more critically how our debt situation can you know, relieve us of, of climate concerns when we talk about debt for, debt for climate swaps. So over. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ma. That's, that's a, such a uh, important, a great overview of the situation in Nigeria. And indeed, as Ma said, we, uh, we will first have the, the other two presenters speak to, uh, to their context before we then turn to, uh, to, to the solutions that each of the uh, the research teams are working on. In the meantime, uh, as uh, I, I encourage everybody to put comments, questions, share information in the in the chat box that's available to uh, to everybody. Um, on my list, Paul is next. Paul, I can't see you at this point of time. Are you there? I'm around. I'm around. <laughs> I'm glad you are. I just can see you. So, so next then is is Paul Akuma. Paul, Paul is uh, is a research fellow at EPRC uh, in in Uganda, and he will similar to uh, to Ma will give us an overview of the debt situation in uh, in his context. Uh, thanks, Paul. Yeah, um, um, my oral presentation is pretty much uh, uh, similar to all the previous speakers, including the His Excellency the Ambassador. Um, uh, and uh, uh, the, the only difference maybe is, uh, is that our study is looking at the distributional impacts of, uh, of debt uh, on households, farms, and uh, uh, other groups uh, such as women and uh, the vulnerable groups such as women and uh, youth. Uh, uh, the greater, um, uh, the bigger picture here is how debt could impede uh, development and perpetuate inequality and poverty. Um, uh, given the context of Uganda, uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, of course, has caused a surge in public finance need. Uh, of course, this is to mitigate uh, the socioeconomic uh, consequences. And uh, Uganda um, required a gross financing of about six billion US dollars between um, 2021 and 2022 respond to the crisis. IMF has provided the bulk of that financing uh, up to now, now close to uh, 2 billion US dollars. Uh, in the short term, um, the average uh, debt to GDP ratios, some of the indicators we could look at, uh, is expected to increase significantly. Currently, we are at 51% from 46% uh, in 2019. The pre-pandemic uh, uh, indicator was 46% of GDP. And uh, when we decompose uh, some of these indices, um, we see that uh, debt dynamics are being driven mainly by uh, growing depreciation of, of the shilling to the dollar. Although of recent, the shilling has been appreciating due to high inflation rates in the US, uh, up to 7%, unprecedented in the last 40, 40 years. Um, nevertheless, interest expenses, uh, we have to pay more. Ma has mentioned Nigeria is paying um, up to 80% of revenue in debt, uh, to, to using up to eight, close to more than 80% of uh, revenue to service debt. Uh, uh, later, I will show you that the, the number is higher in Uganda, and of course, higher primary deficit. Uh, nevertheless, a strong uh, pre-COVID uh, 
growth rates, strong growth rates of uh, average of 6%. Uganda has been growing uh, for more, uh, at an average of 6% for the last two decades. Um, did help to dampen the rate of, uh, of the growth of debt to GDP ratio. Uh, other major drivers of debt dynamics uh, are high inflation, uh, though uh, during, surprisingly, during the uh, COVID pandemic, inflation remained uh, uncharacteristically low. Of course, we uh, have we face problems of weak governance, uh, which uh, uh, the ambassador earlier uh, uh, spoke about: issues of transparency, issues of accountability. Um, especially when it comes to security spending. And um, to crown it all, weaknesses in uh, revenue mobilization. Uh, we currently, our revenue to GDP is at uh, 12%, uh, which is unlike countries of similar uh, development rates, which are at about 20%. Um, this is largely uh, because of uh, the political economy and uh, uh, a very large informal sector. So let's look at some of the debt indices. Debt service, uh, uh, it's 97% uh, of domestic revenue. So we are left with only 3% uh, from, uh, from whatever is collected domestically to spend on, uh, uh, um, on, on activities. Uh, it's 30% of uh, um, debt service is at 30% of GDP, yet, uh, um, Expenditure on education and health is at 12%. Uh, debt uh, to, to exports um, uh, is at 200%. Uh, and this is mainly due to poor export performance. Uh, external debt, uh, Uganda external debt, uh, percent of GDP is at uh, 40%. And um, a domestic debt, uh, Recently, we noticed uh, that local currency debt has increased since 2019, accounting to close to 40% of total debt stock. Um, and close to 80% of this stock of domestic debt is uh, short term. Uh, and it's poised to mature in less than a year, in less than three five days. Our revenue, uh, as I earlier mentioned, uh, COVID-19, even before COVID-19, we had revenue uh, challenges. Uh, domestic revenue challenges, uh, but uh, COVID-19 has uh, overemphasized this, this fact and has led to shrinkage of revenue. Uh, and it means Uganda has to borrow more funds uh, to fund the budget. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, International Monetary Fund has advanced, uh, at least we have spent up to 490 million US dollars uh, to beef up our reserves. Um, uh, what what are the key key stories we notice? We notice like three key key issues. One is the composition of Uganda's debt. Uh, it continues to shift towards commercial, both domestically and uh, externally, and non pari clubs. This this uh, is heralding and signaling the rise of China and other non traditional lenders, uh, and from external also to domestic, as I mentioned earlier, we are increasingly borrowing in domestically from the commercial banks, but at a high interest rate of 14%. And, um, and uh, a lot of this debt matures in less than a year, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, and I, I've, I've mentioned, uh, as, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, commercial and credit, uh, commercial creditors and then Paris club issue creditors have increasingly Supplied new financing to Uganda. Then the outlook for Uganda's debt sustainability is challenged by emerging risk and uh, vulnerability, particularly, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, fast growing interest expenses, which is at 97% of revenue. Uh, rollover risk. This rollover risk is, uh, is mainly with domestic debt, uh, which matures so quickly and the government doesn't have the resources to finance it. So it rolls it over to the future. So we pay the interest, we roll over the principal. And uh, uh, we feel this is becoming un un unsustainable. There's a narrowing uh, differential between real interest rate and uh, growth. Um, there's expanding contingent liabilities, particularly with uh, state-owned enterprises. 
and uh, debt collateralization, and of course, issues concerning governance, particularly with uh, transparency, uh, particularly with transparency and uh, inclusivity in matters of management of debt. Um, we, re we recognize uh, the, the impact and the role debt reliefs initiatives uh, have played in the past, particularly in alleviating debt burden. However, uh, weak macroeconomic fundamentals and uh, global economic and financial crisis and uh, the growing uh, ease in accessibility of non-concessional financing from markets and from non-traditional donors such as China may, and, and the impacts of COVID-19, uh, uh, which, which have presented more needs for, for fiscal expansion, may propel debt levels back to the danger zones uh, of Paul, can I uh, can I can I just uh, stop you there? I, something happened to the system. I think you got muted. That was not me, but I, I did want to ask you to wrap up. We we'll come we we'll come uh, we'll come back to uh, the the solutions that you're working on in uh, in a few minutes. But I first wanted to round off that uh, that the first set of interventions uh, with a presentation on uh, on on Ethiopia. Uh, Alamayo, Professor Alamayo Geda is a professor of economics at Addis Ababa University, uh, and uh, and we look forward to your presentation. Alamayo, if I can ask you to be, uh, as a, as we knew, the program is very crowded. If I can can ask you to do that uh, that that briefly, so we can get to the next round as well. Thank you. Good. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll be very brief. I understand the <clears throat> the problem the problem of timing. Uh, uh, the Ethiopian uh, pretty much you know the the over uh, the overall uh, uh, trend expressed by Ambassador as well as uh, Aishag are pretty much reflected in Ethiopian, in Ethiopian condition. Now, it, in Ethiopia, uh, the, the level of state, both public and private, are equally important. Like we owe something like 29 billion external, and the domestic uh, debt is as much. And both of them are putting significant pressure uh, on the macro economy. Uh, the, 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 the domestic debt uh, is invariably monetized monetize it. As a result, we have significant inflation, uh, inflation now running uh, 35% and the food inflation uh, 41%. So uh, it has expressed itself in that currency is depreciating, uh, domestic debt is accumulating. Now the external, the external one, the external one is putting pressure on meager foreign exchange uh, that we have. Uh, as a result, we, the country is currently in serious liquidity problem and in areas to, to serve the debt. Because uh, on the average, uh, we literally export, merchandise export is about 3 billion. Uh, the service export on a net basis is zero. The net export is zero. So we, ha we have to focus on merchandise exporters. Now, when we focus on merchandise exporters, uh, out of three billion, nearly two billion we pay for for external debt. So, nearly two thirds of uh, our exports just gone for uh, uh, this. Now, in addition to this, there are uh, the uh, the country, the macroeconomy is vulnerable, and the debt situation is making it worse. Like when the commodity uh, fundamental change in commodity price, we are vulnerable. Like for instance, now with oil as an oil importer, and we, uh, we have, uh, we will have a problem, you know, one year down the line. And when there is global economic shock, like the Ukraine-Russia uh, conflict uh, war, actually, then we have again a, a, a problem because food prices are increasing. We are exporting, importing a lot of wheat uh, and iron from Ukraine out of, uh, you know, so, our imports from European Union is about 30%, but 60% is from Ukraine and Russia. So when there is this global shock, it affects uh, the, the macroeconomy. Then when the pandemic comes like COVID, uh, it affects the economy. And all this have a huge pressure on liquidity. Uh, therefore, even if 
you have the potential to pay, even if you are solvent, you know, solvent, they can't enable uh, because of liquidity uh, problem. It claims uh, that there's two thirds of its exporters. Now, second problem is the composition was changing over time. About 50% of the debt owes to the bilater bilateral donors. Uh, the other 30% is, uh, I'm sorry, 50% is to multilateral donors. Uh, the African develop the share of African Development Bank and IFIs, the World Bank, being in the ratio of 80-20. Now, the rest, like 30%, is bilateral, of which the Paris Club is just about 3%. So the entire thing on China, uh, on China. And then the, the, the rest is for private uh, uh, borrowing, including Eurobond. Now, the problem with this is that, one, uh, given the information we have, relatively, you know, the Chinese uh, the, the, is expensive. And second, uh, it is not transparent. You don't get detailed terms of engagement. And for some of the projects, it is very, very expensive. So transparency and changing composition is a second problem apart, apart from the vulnerability I noticed. The third problem we have is a sort of long-term and solvency related issues uh, is three problems we have here on sort of medium to longer term. So these are, first of all, Invariably, as, as that of the rest of Africa, the, the, the Ethiopian debt problem primarily looks like a trade problem because, you know, the, the, the export is not growing well because 90 percent of our exports are primary commodities. And whenever the global market shocks on the commodity markets, we become vulnerable. So that that fundamental problem at, uh, is still there. Second is, you know, there is ambitious growth. Uh, target. And this could be many factors for this. Probably it, it could be to reduce you know, the level of high poverty in the country. It could be motivated by corruption because we found in the in in some of our economic analysis that debt has a positive effect on capital flight. Uh, so it could be motivated by uh, uh, mm. corruption. So it could be purely motivated to have high growth. Therefore, uh, the government was to reduce poverty. Whatever it is, all this puts significant pressure on physical uh, position of the country. And this physical position is invariably either domestically mo monetized or led to debt creating flaws. So that, this, these are also fundamental uh, problems. Together with these are conditionalities, uh, conditionalities. Uh, because you are extremely dependent on the finances. Uh, there are various uh, conditionalities that start from the, the typical, uh, you know, uh, IFA sub structural adjustment kind conditionality uh, uh, are facing the country. So these are the fundamental problems. I will, I will come back to some of the solutions that we are working on later. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank Thank you so much, Professor Geda. Um, th th these are such important and detailed descriptions of each of these contexts with the commonalities uh, and, and but, but also the differences. Um, I, I will apologize for for my uh, for my timekeeping. We only have 15 minutes left, and I think the best we can do. I'm going to slightly vary the way the the order of speaking, but uh, but I'm going to invite each of the speakers uh, in a slightly different order again to speak to one. One or two of the most, uh, just in two minutes, please. Right, just what are the most important issues? You've, you've we've heard this call uh, of of uh, of those nationals solutions and research for those national solutions are needed to inform, of course, national policy, but also the global debate. So, and 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 there's there's a large uh, diversity, uh, a large array of things that that you're working on and need to need to be worked on. So, so if you could just briefly tell the audience what are the one or two major issues that you're working on to contribute to solutions. And I'm going to start with Ma and and ask her particularly to focus on on her work on on climate and 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 that for uh, for development. Uh, swaps. Ma, if you can, I know it's it's a hard task to do that in two minutes, but we only have 15 minutes left. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. So, 
Okay, so uh, the Nigeria case study, we're focusing on debt for climate swaps and the reason is that we're a highly climate vulnerable and uh, country and we also have high debt risk. So what the paper does is that based on five indicators, the World Risk Index for Climate and Disaster Risk, the GEF Benefits Index for, for Biodiversity, External Debts as a share of GNI, Debt Service Payments and the Idea Resource Allocation Index, we group countries into you know whether they are high climate vulnerable, whether they are highly climate vulnerable, or or not, whether they have high debt risk or not. And Nigeria falls into the top right quadrants of being both highly climate vulnerable and also having high debt risk. And another trend that we see in Nigeria, which um, Ramiro highlighted earlier, is that there's a trade-off between. Uh, that's making debt service payments and investing in key sectors such as education, health, women related sectors or gender equality sectors, and also in, uh, in the environment. Um, and so uh, one, and so we use a, a scenario based analysis to determine how much can be saved if the country engages in debt for, debt for development swaps with its creditors. Um, we use a scenario-based analysis based on historical precedents because not all creditors are willing to engage in, in such initiatives. Um, for the first scenario, the, the baseline scenario, we ask what if ODA eligible Paris Club debts and the worst performing euro bonds, so private creditors um, and bilateral creditors, what if they participate? And we find that there'll be savings of $3.7 billion. We go a step further and ask, what if multilateral concessional debt is added to the mix? How much will be saved? And we find that $11.8 billion will be saved. Now, for the pessimistic scenario, which only allows for ODA eligible Paris Club debts, we find that $744 million will be saved. And this is one issue that is important to note here. The fact, the heterogeneity of the of the creditor landscape and the fact that historical precedence shows that not all creditors will be willing to come to the table. Um, if the debt eligible to be swapped under the baseline scenario is swapped, we find that we will have a savings of about $300 million per year. We also have a, a list of projects that, that you know, we're suggesting uh, for these savings to, to finance. And uh, so just the key policy recommendation is that the fund needed projects, you know, debt, debt for development swaps can fund needed projects in areas neglected during the times of economic downturn. Um, thank you, and, and I'll hand over quickly to the next presenter. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's an, it, a very, very so wonderfully brief and, and such an important uh, contribution to this. And, and we'll definitely come uh, come back to this. And, and I'm sure we'll have other sharing of webinars on, on this particular topic. Perhaps Ramiro, can you go go next? And, and I, I know that 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 that, that for uh, the, the, the climate angle is also important in, in, in your work. Any any thoughts on that, please? Yes, I mean, I, I will I will complement mass views on on on, on debt swaps, uh, trying to focus on the, the 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 issue that the common framework, for example, in the sheet twenty, is uh, using the debt sustainability analysis, typical prototypical debt sustainability analysis, that was very good for upper middle income countries, but that is not that good for lower middle income countries and low middle income countries. Particularly, it focuses a lot on short term financial risks that dominate the scene. Living, I mean, so, so the, the only goal is just to create fiscal space in the short run, you know? So I think that we need to move away from this view. We need to reframe the sustainability analysis in the World Bank, in IMF, in all our multilaterals to incorporate issues of long-term growth, inclusion, and sustainable development. MASEX is one example of this type of views. We are doing that in research, but we, but in, in, in our global institutions, we are still stick to this 
uh, uh, dead sustainability analysis where there are not local contexts, but also, again, the focus is on short term uh, uh, financial sustainability without any uh, uh, discussion on uh, uh, capital investment, the youth and gender as inclusion and sustainable development. So I think that we, we need to work on redesigning these type of toolkits because again, they will shape the domestic policies under some con conditionality C. Thanks very much, uh, for, uh, Ramiro, uh, very important. Isaac, I see you nodding, but maybe I can ask you to hold on your thoughts for, for concluding comments. And first go back to uh, to Paul and Alamayu, uh, maybe in that order. Uh, Paul, um, you were muted before uh, unintentionally. Maybe if, uh, I hope this that problem is resolved. Uh, can you, again, also in two minutes, can you just tell us what are the main areas you're working on in terms of solutions and then i'll turn to alamayo next and isa for the last words paul go ahead yeah uh, broadly it's uh, on um uh, building debt um, um sustainability framework which reflect uh, local context uh but largely uh uh and, and mainly uh, looking at strengthening the links between uh, debt financing and, uh, and and growth returns, particularly in improvement in efficiency of debt finance investments, that would ensure debt is used to finance the most uh, productive projects. Uh, that that goes into our issues of selections of projects, uh, selecting the right projects, because there's a tendency in in uh, uh, in developing countries to go for the big infrastructure uh, projects, yet the returns are so low, at, le at least in the short run. Thank you. Great. Th thanks. Thanks so much. And also highlighting of, again the need for specificity in the debt sustainability analysis, which is absolutely critical in the support that countries get for the international community. Right. And again, Isaac, I, I'm sure you have lots to say about it. Alamayo, from your side, what are the uh, the, the key issues you, you're working on, the key priority that coming out of your work in terms of solutions. You're still muted, uh, Alamayo. Okay, I I thank you. I completely share uh, Ramio's and uh, Paul's uh, pointers. Uh, these are also very important in European context. Uh, but uh, to go deeper, to go deeper. The kind of uh, I'm, I'm think, I'm, we are thinking like Paul, the efficiency of public spending, uh, in particular, debt financed uh, 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 spending is very important. But the 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 financing can go to directly to the budget support. Therefore, capacity building, capacity building at the Ministry of uh, Finance about both debt management and uh, both you know, uh, grows uh, planning so that you will be, you will not be um, ambitious uh, so that whatever project you choose, uh, it will have a return that you will, you will need in time. Kind of capacity building is one area we are uh, thinking. The second one is sort of global, global, uh, you know, transparency and uh, 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 preparing for alignment of conditionalities with uh, a country's development strategy at the global level it would be important instead of you know imposing conditions, uh, you know, uh, pressuring them to align with the development strategy of a country instead by taking the local context would are the policy directions we are thinking. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you so much. So 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 important, and 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 again directly, you know, feeding into that call of, of we need to connect. That, that that national and it's just emphasize the capacity as well to those global debates. Thank you for that. Isaac, uh, we're almost at the end. We got five minutes left. So so I turn it back to uh, to you now. And as we try that, Isaac may have disappeared. And but I see if No, so the 
um, well, Isaac's electricity might have gone. As he said, he was he is in in Lebanon uh, in in the eye of the storm, as he as he called it, uh, and 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 the dire finance situation might have cut him out for now. Um, um, l let me go back to uh, and particularly in the case of of Uganda and Ethiopia. Ah, Isaac, you're back. We didn't we miss you <laughs> yeah, there for a second. I, mean, I just said that we got four minutes left now, uh, and I saw okay. you nodding on many of the comments that were made earlier. Uh, why don't we turn back to you for the for the Thanks for the, so. uh, the last intervention? No, it's quite miraculous that I was able to go back. No, I think there is a very strong consensus that in this kind of new generation of, of, of reforms and debt deals. We have to go beyond the Washington consensus, which was tighten your belts, liberalize, close your eyes, right? Now it's all about efficiency and about better governance, about second generation reforms, really. And this is what Ramiro was saying in terms of the DSA should pick uh, reforms that give us larger growth in the future. So, you know, we need to project growth better in those debt deals, but we need to also do the reforms that give us higher growth. So in terms of the programs, I think what it really means is that these programs have to be balanced across fiscal and austerity, structural and governance. Any one of them alone is not going to be sufficient. If you just tighten your belt, uh, you're going to hurt growth and hurt creditworthiness and create political risk. And it, it is gonna, going to be much worse even than in the 80s. We'll have a lost decade or more. Uh, you, you can't just focus on the structural if you haven't tightened your belt to some extent. I mean, there was easy money in the past. And so some belt tightening, more efficiency is needed in public finance. There is technology. We need to start increasing tax revenues. Uh, more uh, stopping capital flight, uh, including internationally, and there are now mechanisms to do so. Uh, but the, the second agenda, the structural, is super important. Uh, you know, as I described before, we are in another world. We have to improve efficiency, uh, manage infrastructure better, possibly with cost recovery, more active private sector to bring in technological disruption with the new technologies. Uh, socially higher uh, female labor force participation, new program on climate. So there's a whole bunch of new mechanism and new challenges to address on the structural. And finally, none of this will work without better governance, more adapted to those needs, uh, more voice, uh, horizontal and vertical accountability uh, to reduce corruption, f freer private sector. Uh, all this is going to be equally needed, and and so these programs have to be much more balanced than than in the, in the in the in the past. And in a way, one can describe that as this you know classical trilemma that we talk about. Any going in any one direction alone will hurt the two others, and therefore the balance between the three dimension is really going to be crucial going forward. Thank you, uh, thank you so much. We're, we're going to uh, to wrap up, and it's very happy that uh, Professor El Badawi has put up his hand because it's appropriate that he will have the last word. I think uh, before we do that, just as people are leaving, uh, Ibrahim, I just want to make sure that I that I thank everybody for dedicating the time to uh, to this. My colleagues at IDRC, uh, all the all the speakers. Thank you to the audience for engaging. Uh, I know people's schedules are very busy, and also thank you very much to uh, to our colleagues. Colleagues at the uh, at the embassy in uh, New York and Veronique that uh, in particular that made this uh, possible. Uh, we will follow up on this. It, it's it's a great start of a conversation and and uh, and and like I said, I can't think of a better way to to ask Ibrahim, who's the the director of the Economic Research Forum based in uh, in in uh, based in Egypt, uh, but working on the uh, on on the MENA region uh, to uh, to for for the last words on this. Thank you, Ibrahim, for joining. You're still muted, uh, Ibrahim. Thanks, Arian and, uh, and colleagues uh, for this very fascinating conversation. And uh, I just wanted to uh, mention uh, uh, an interesting uh, uh, conference that uh, GDN will be organizing in November in uh, Clermont Ferrand in France. And uh, we plan as ARF to organize a session 
on uh, on taxation and uh, and SDGs, and it pretty much I think relate to what uh, Ishak and, and the others were saying about the need for resource mobilization, uh, domestic resource mobilization, not only digitalization but also trust, which relates to the political agenda that uh, Ishak is talking about, and I think this is. Uh, an interesting uh, kind of focus and very relevant to the conversation. I just wanted to raise one point uh, raised by, well, actually maybe question or ask a question. Uh, some 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 scholars think that the the global economy is not about to close up. Uh, so exporting will continue to generate foreign exchange, uh, uh, but only a few firms that are highly productive uh, are going to be involved. And so there is a crisis of uh, labor absorption. Uh, so the, 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 the challenge might not be limited foreign exchange going forward, but maybe actually the related to the uh, the tech economic order that exporting firms that are high productivity firms uh, are going to reduce uh, or going to absorb less labor as opposed to be the case before. And so therefore there is need for linking gross strategies with uh, with social social agenda. Uh, so I was wondering, you know, if Ishaq also believe that uh, there will be uh, limited opportunities for uh, for exporting, that will be an added challenge as well. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you so much. And I was indeed thinking about, as you said, the tightening the belt now will not do, right? Uh, we have to find the right uh, that will will leave us further behind in those difficult contexts. So, so uh, I'm, I'm sure there'll be much more. A lot of the research will focus on now on exactly those questions, right? In those contexts, uh, tightening the belt does not will not suffice. Uh, we need that context-specific analysis to find those uh, those the, the, those best investments in those contexts. So, so thank you so much. I, I, I it's, it's. Uh, we're at the end of time, so we won't, won't prolong the discussion. Uh, people be very generous with their time. Thank you so much again, everybody. And, and we we'll hope we'll stay in touch, keep sharing uh, uh, information. We'll come back at, at many of this conference. I think this, uh, Ibrahim, absolutely, this is a moment where we need to work with all those global research institutions to support the work that you're doing uh, wider in uh, in, uh, in Finland equally is, is in interested, obviously interested in this topic. So we'll absolutely continue those conversations. Thank you so much, everybody, and, and uh, stay well and see you soon. Thanks. Bye. <laughs>